Hello. Hello, everybody. How are you? Good. Excellent. We're all good because this is the fifth annual Social Justice Week of Ryerson. Yay for that. Woo and we have an amazing panel right here that is going to educate us, entertainment, entertain us as well with their stories, but also is going to touch our uh, solidarity hearts. My name is Janet Rodriguez. I am a continuing education student here at Ryerson, but I'm also a member of the uh, student union for part-times. It's called Cesar for short. And uh, together with me is Lizelle. Lizelle is a staff at the Center for Women in Trans, is one of the six equity center services that are run by students and for students. So Lisel has a few announcements for you. Um, so just to start off, um, we're going to acknowledge the land that we were on. Um, so as many of us are settlers on this land, it is our collective responsibility to pay respect and recognize that this land is traditional territory of the Mississauga of the New Credit First Nations, and we are here because this land was occupied. In recognizing that the space occupies colonized First Nations territories, and out of respect for the rights of Indigenous people, it is our collective responsibility to honor, protect, and sustain this land. Thank you, Lisselle. Equally, uh, everything that we do here is political, you know. So we do understand that may, some people may feel a little bit challenged in their beliefs, but uh, that's basically the reason why we have this equity statement. So student union solidarity is based on the principle that all members are equal and deserve mutual respect and understanding. As members of the student unions, mutual respect, cooperation, and understanding are our goals. We should neither condone nor tolerate behavior that undermines the dignity or self-esteem of any individual or creates an intimidating, hostile, or offensive environment. It is our collective responsibility to create an inclusive space for discussion and dialogue. All forms of discrimination and harassment will not be tolerated. Not will hate speech rooted in, but not limited to, anti-Muslim, anti-Arab, anti-Semitic, sexist, racist, classist, ableist, homophobic or transphobic sentiments and or remarks. We all have an obligation to ensure that an open and inclusive space free of hate is established. If you are not here in an understanding of good faith or you have violated this understanding, you will be asked to leave politely. So um, just my last bit here for all of you would be to uh, tell you the great news that we have happening right here at the Student Union Center, 55 Gould. Most of you know because we've been doing this for the last six weeks. Come vote. Uh, we have a special poll that started yesterday. Anybody, anybody can vote. You don't have to be a student. You don't even have to be from Toronto. You vote here for your home writing. Yesterday we have folks from BC voting in for their home writing right here. Quebec, Manitoba. You name it, we had a lot of people going through. Takes 15, 20 minutes, you know, maybe a couple of games in your phone if you're bored. But it's an amazing thing that uh, the Canadian Federation of Students have supported us, the students, to have these polls on campus. And they will be open tomorrow and Thursday as well, from 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. And somebody says there's going to be hot chocolate, so just saying. So please come vote. Tell everybody everybody and come vote. With that said, I'm going to leave Winnie to continue with the program. Thank you. Let's hear it for Winnie. Good evening. Yeah. 
Um, on behalf of Ryerson, I want to welcome you here, Ryerson campus. This is a really, really special evening. Um, first of all, it's, I have my good friend, a sister from Hong Kong, Elizabeth Tang, who is here as the General Secretary of the International Domestic Workers Federation. And she has already on Sunday met with a number of caregiv living caregivers and migrant farm workers. And to me, I think that's where the spirit in, in terms of bridging between the academy and community is all about. So here I want to acknowledge in particular the effort, the organizing, and the energy of our community partners for this particular event tonight, the Caregivers Action Center. Yeah. Who are you? <laughs> um, the Workers' Alliance for Change. Yeah. And Justice for Migrant Workers, Chris. And, and I also want to acknowledge uh, Dina Ladd, who's here from the Workers' Action Center. Yeah. And uh, Sister Marie Clark Walker, Executive Vice President of the Canadian Labor of Congress, who has a portfolio of human rights, migrant workers, and anti-racism. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Sadef Arakkos. Uh, Sadef is the Associate Professor in the Department of Politics and Public Administration, a member of the Yates School of Graduate Studies at Ryerson. She received her PhD in sociology at the University of Toronto. And Sadef's research interests have include immigra immigration policy, citizenship, especially as they affect immigrant women, transnational feminism, and all the other good pieces. As part of the reason we invited Sadef to moderate the sessions is way back when she, she worked as a volunteer, she worked closely with Philly Vellison, the late Philly Vellison in Interseat in pushing on migrant workers, domestic workers issues. So that's why this is a special spot for her. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Sadef Arad Kot. Thank you. I would like to welcome everyone to this very important panel. Uh, the, uh, uh, for a week that focuses on social justice issues. Uh, the, the questions surrounding domestic workers' rights or lack thereof uh, are some of the most important social justice issues in, in Canada, as well as around the world at the moment. And I'm very, very honored and pleased to be part uh, or, or, or to be moderating a, a panel with such uh, outstanding uh, speakers. Uh, I also uh, know that there, there are several uh, very uh, important activists uh, in the audience at the moment, and I, I hope that uh, at the end of the panel we will hear from them also. Um, now, uh, the, as uh, many of you uh, might be uh, aware, uh, Canada has moved increasingly over the last few decades uh, from a country of permanent residency to a country that is now uh, preferring uh, to, to get uh, migrant, uh, temporary migrant workers uh, instead as, as, um, as people coming to this country. And that is used as a very specific kind of strategy precisely to uh, produce conditions uh, of unequal status, vulnerable status, uh, and inability to negotiate working conditions and so on, and some very negative working conditions for those uh, who are coming under this status. Uh, and uh, since 2006 especially, uh, this government has moved more and more in this direction. Uh, of creating uh, conditions of vulnerability and unequal status for increased numbers of, of people. So I think this is an extremely important panel and I don't want to say too much more and, and take away from the uh, specific contributions of, of the uh, presenters, but I also would like to say that uh, for those people who are interested in, in questions of migration, another issue that might be foremost in their minds these days is the uh, question of uh, refugees, uh, especially uh, 
refugees coming from uh, Africa and the Middle East and, and moving to uh, European countries at the moment. Uh, when we organized uh, the, the Social Justice Week, or I, I shouldn't make, take ownership of this, Winnie did it uh, in an uh, Hercules ma manner. Uh, when uh, Winnie organized this event, the uh, refugee crisis in Europe had not reached uh, this, uh, these proportions yet. Uh, and uh, it was still a very important issue, but, but it has become much more uh, in the forefront uh, of, of news and, and so on. Uh, I just want to say that in coming weeks, there will be events that Winnie will also help organize around the, the refugee crisis. But for this panel, we will be focusing mostly on, on the question uh, of migrant workers. Not that these two categories are completely separate from one another. I think it is important to recognize that the, the categories often blend in with one another in the real world where uh, people uh, are often refugees and migrants at, at the same time. Uh, so we, we have to be, uh, on the one hand, using the distinction in some contexts, but also refusing to uh, accept a very rigid uh, division between these two uh, categories. Uh, let me introduce the, the first speaker. Uh, our first speaker is Elizabeth Tang. Uh, Elizabeth uh, Tang is the international coordinator and general secretary of the International Domestic Workers Federation. This is the only, uh, th this is a global organization of domestic workers. Uh, it's a uh, it's a member-specific uh, organization, and it's the only women uh, union federation organized by uh, women domestic workers across the world. Uh, so it's a real pleasure to, to have uh, a representative from uh, such a, an important uh, organization. Elizabeth Tang ha has an MA in Sociology of Labor, uh, from Warwick University uh, in the United Kingdom. Uh, she's, uh, she has over 20 years of experience in trade union organizing. She's the formal chief executive of the independent Hong Kong trade union movement, the Hong Kong Co Confederation of Trade Unions, uh, and, and the uh, Hong Kong Conf uh, Con Confederation of Trade Unions for over uh, 15 years. Uh, Let's welcome uh, Elizabeth Tang. Uh, good evening. Um, so before I start, I'd like uh, to introduce you uh, another um, uh, colleague of my organization, Jill Schenker. She is the uh, coordinator for North America. I'd like to uh, divide my presentation into two parts. Uh, the first is about um, migrant domestic workers. Uh, I'll give you uh, some uh, uh, facts, uh, how they are like today, and also how they are organized. And then the second part will be specifically on my organizations, uh, which is uh, a very young organization, but uh, nevertheless, uh, they are interesting uh, stories uh, to, to be shared. Um, actually, uh, how many migrant domestic workers in the world? Uh, nobody really knows. Uh, according to the official figure of the International Labor Organization, uh, there are over 53 million domestic workers in the world, plus 30 million child domestic workers. Mm -hmm. So uh, the estimate is about half of them are migrant domestic workers. But this number exclude those who are undocumented. And in some countries, we know that there are more undocumented domestic workers than the documented ones. So, so nobody really know how many are they in the world. Um, so uh, at the same time you are looking at these pictures, um, yeah, uh, I don't have to 
uh, go into details on how they are uh, being treated, uh, what kind of uh, problems, abuses uh, they face. You, know, uh, you can see here. But what I want to stress is that uh, these pictures, these photos were about uh, migrant domestic workers, uh, some of their uh, uh, being abused, uh, living in the shelter in Hong Kong. Hong Kong is uh, widely thought to be a place where relatively migrant domestic workers have better protection because according to our law, they are protected or included in the same uh, labor law, trade union law as the local workers. So they have a minimum wage protection, they have holiday, they have weekly rest, they have a maternity leave. So uh, especially uh, in our part of the world, uh, Asian region, uh, you know, Hong Kong really uh, is thought to be, you know, like uh, a very, very good place for migrant domestic workers. But still, you know, what you are seeing now, you know, they, they are still a lot of uh, abusers, you know, a lot of uh, migrant domestic workers you know, face um, uh, this kind of uh, uh, situations. So, um, uh, the, the problem is really, even though they are being protected uh, legally, like uh, those in Hong Kong, but because they are migrants, so they are, also, they are still uh, vulnerable. They are migrant workers, so like many countries in the world, uh, they are tied to the employers. In Hong Kong, uh, there is mandatory live-in arrangement. So when they arrive, they have to stay with the employers. <coughs> There's no other choice. Even the employees agree they cannot live outside. So, so that's why they have to work, you know, as long as uh, there's demand from the employer, they have to work. And, uh, and then many of them come with a lot of debts because they, most of them pay ha a lot of fees to, their, to the agencies which arrange them to come to, to the employers. So the moment they arrive, they are already heavily in debt. So in order to earn enough to pay the debts, they will just do whatever the employers tell them to do. So one of the photos uh, is about Ariana. Uh, this case uh, has been very, very well known in Hong Kong because uh, 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 Ariana had been badly abused by her employer. But uh, fortunately, uh, uh, the case came to light and then uh, uh, with the support of uh, trade unions and uh, migrants groups in Hong Kong, uh, uh, finally the employer was uh, persecuted and now uh, she is in jail uh, with a six years uh, sentence. Um, but uh, unfortunately, um, a lot, a lot more domestic workers who, uh, who have uh, bad experiences like Ariana uh, will never uh, have uh, such an uh, ending, uh, you know, simply because either there's no law in the countries uh, to protect them or because of uh, corruption, uh, you know, there's no legal uh, uh, justice for them. So even though they, uh, there is injustice on them, they are being uh, abused, but still they, they have no way to complain and if they complain, uh, then uh, they are being exposed and they will just be deported. So that's what, that's why uh, uh, complaints are still really rare. So what is uh, uh, important for us to note is that um, uh, despite there have been uh, several waves of uh, economic crisis, you know, where we talk about huge loss of jobs, but jobs uh, in, the, in the domestic uh, sector anywhere in the world has been rising in the past 20 years. Uh, uh, we know it's because of the demographic changes in, the, in, the, in many industrialized countries, so there is a higher demand for uh, migrant domestic workers who are cheap, who are flexible, uh, you know, to, to fill the gap of needs, but at the same time, uh, more and more government uh, realize that uh, this is really a, 
a very profitable business uh, because uh, these workers who go out to work send money back and, and, and this call in remittances, uh, you know, uh, uh, make up a huge uh, portion of the GDP. For example, in Nepal, uh, last year, 50% of the GDP of the country comes from remittances from, uh, from their migrant uh, workers. So this has become very uh, lucrative. And, and increasingly, governments are even trying to compete with each other uh, to get this you know, job opportunities for the migrant uh, uh, women. Uh, just uh, a few weeks ago, uh, the government uh, in Bangladesh has pledged uh, to send two million workers uh, to other countries in the next five years as uh, part of the development uh, package. Uh, and, um, and how these uh, women will be sent, uh, really no, nobody knows. But uh, they will, most of them will definitely uh, be managed by private uh, uh, recruiter or private uh, employment agencies uh, who care nothing but only uh, money. So, uh, you know, this is also a very important uh, phenomenon we have to uh, note because uh, a lot of uh, exploitation also comes uh, because of these uh, private arrangements. And then there are countries which, uh, f uh, for example, uh, Indonesia, which uh, also make it mandatory for women who want to migrate to work to go through uh, employment agencies. So according to the government, this is one way to protect uh, these women because they are women. I mean, if they are men, they don't have to do it. But if they are women, they have to go through uh, employment agencies. So again, you know, this has increased the vulnerability and exploitation of the women. Um, um, yeah, the, so the increase of, of uh, migrant domestic workers, or in Canada you call caregivers, um, uh, you know, which uh, you know, helps to uh, solve a lot of uh, social economic uh, uh, gaps in the destination countries, but uh, unfortunately, we see that uh, a government, the world government's uh, responses uh, have been uh, going from, uh, from bad to worse. Uh, um, yeah, we just heard that in Canada, um, the, the, the new program have, um, uh, is, is now making it very difficult for the, for the migrant workers to get residency right. Uh, and the same thing actually has happened in the UK two years ago, which also uh, tied the migrant domestic workers to the employers. So this, this was also uh, something new, um, uh, making uh, the domestic workers uh, uh, impossible to change employers. Um, and then uh, because of the increase in numbers, a government also look for measures to so-called uh, manage or regulate uh, migration. And, uh, and they, uh, uh, the, uh, the way they use is to introduce a so-called circular migration that is uh, to uh, uh, give very short-term contracts to these uh, migrant domestic workers, usually two years, and after that they have to return to the countries, but then they can go back again uh, on a two years contract, and then they, after that they have to go back. So in this way, uh, these workers are always on the move. Uh, they will not uh, be, uh, come eligible not to speak uh, of uh, becoming a resident, but even to become eligible for uh, uh, social protection or any kind of social security is uh, uh, impossible. And that also make it difficult to, to organize because you know, they're always on the move. So, so really there's very little value uh, to organize, to think about um, including these workers in the, in the local organizations. Um, so talk about organizing uh, migrant domestic workers. Uh, it, is, it is true, uh, domestic workers are, are already not well organized. Uh, but uh, in the case of migrant dom domestic workers, this is even worse uh, for, uh, for, the f uh, 
for the reasons uh, I, uh, I have uh, talked about. Um, uh, and yep, the, the fact that uh, many of them are uh, undocumented, so making the, uh, the invisible even more, more invisible. Uh, in Europe, um, uh, actually, uh, according to the laws, uh, all the domestic workers, uh, including migrant domestic workers, uh, enjoy same rights, uh, equal rights as the local workers, and they are also free to join uh, uh, the local trade unions. But because most of them are undocumented, so uh, uh, for example, in Germany, uh, the union which uh, uh, signed collective agreement uh, covering domestic workers has uh, less than 100 members. So because largely uh, they are undocumented, so so they don't uh, uh, join trade union, which has a collective agreement covering. So you can uh, uh, imagine the, you know, the uh, magnitude of the problems. Uh, but then on the other hand, um, if we look deeper, uh, uh, actually there are, are many uh, smaller or informal uh, non-trade union uh, labor organization uh, of uh, migrant domestic workers. Uh, many of them are are based in the in the churches or um, in the in the communities uh, where the uh, the migrant workers uh, usually live together, uh, but then these organizations are so small or so informal or even visible. So usually they are being overlooked, and uh, and people usually do not see uh, much value of these organizations. Um, but then uh, you know they are. Uh, actually, uh, where we should go to if we really seriously think of uh, organizing them. Um, okay, I'm also conscious of the time. Um, so, uh, yeah, maybe I can uh, talk about my organization. Um, so my organization is, uh, is very young. Uh, it's still less than two years old. Uh, we were formed in uh, October 28. Uh, 2013, so by the end of this month, we will be uh, celebrating our second anniversary. Um, uh, but uh, in many countries, uh, domestic workers have formed their organization a long time ago. Uh, our affiliate in Argentina was formed uh, before the First World War. Uh, and then many of them uh, are formed uh, in uh, uh, in the in the early uh, 2000s, uh, some were formed uh, in the uh, 90s. Um, uh, but uh, but as domestic workers, uh, their organization also uh, you know, used to be invisible, uh, or you know people also you know did not see any value of these organizations, you know because they were formal, they were they were informal, they were very small. Uh, you know they were, you know, largely not uh, included in the in the mainstream uh, trade union movement. Uh, but uh, uh, it, yeah, it was only in uh, two zero zero six that uh, uh, domestic workers leaders uh, from different countries met for the first time at an international conference uh, held in in the Netherlands. Uh, so. For the first time, uh, uh, over 100 domestic workers came together, and then uh, and then they found that oh, there were so many of us in the world, and and our issue, our needs were so were so common and and uh, and, and the same, uh, and they uh, uh, discussed the need to have an international law to protect to recognize domestic workers. Uh, to recognize that they are workers and uh, that as workers uh, they have rights. So, uh, so the proposal went to the ILO uh, and the ILO accepted and, and started a two-year process to, uh, to develop and to adopt an ILO convention uh, on domestic, on decent work for domestic workers. So that two years, um, Actually, uh, more, than, more than two years ago, since uh, 2009, uh, domestic workers' organizations uh, 
became uh, very active uh, in mobilizing domestic workers uh, first to know uh, what is the ILO, uh, why uh, international law is important. Uh, if we have one, uh, what we would like to see in, in, in the law that will be useful for us. And, uh, and this, um, uh, this process uh, were led by a group of uh, domestic workers leaders. Uh, so they first formed the IDWN, the International Domestic Workers Network in 2009. Uh, so uh, my colleague was there, Jill was there, uh, representing the National Domestic Workers Alliance in the US. Uh, I was there representing the trade union in Hong Kong. Um, and. Uh, and uh, we decided uh, to uh, mobilize hard and uh, to, to advocate, uh, to, to talk to our governments uh, to support such an international law. So when I look at uh, the report uh, of, of the activities of, uh, of the uh, IDWN at that time, you know, in, in that uh, four years leading up to the final adoption of the convention in 2011, uh, we have held uh, uh, activities with uh, 78 domestic workers union organizations and uh, over 5,200 have participated in all the activities together in, uh, in 33 countries. And, uh, and, Julie, and uh, at, in the time of this uh, mobilization, uh, almost uh, uh, another uh, 20,000 domestic workers have joined uh, the existing organization at that time. So, you know, it was a very important uh, process, not uh, because uh, it has helped to found uh, uh, the international law to protect domestic workers, but also has given birth uh, to the international domestic workers movement. So when the convention uh, was adopted, we, we uh, we make a big celebration, but then we also make the decision that uh, this momentum uh, must not be lost. Uh, we should build on it. Uh, so uh, we decided uh, to form uh, a permanent organization of domestic workers. So when we uh, mobilized uh, for the convention, uh, we worked with uh, 78 organizations, but then uh, when we uh, at the end, uh, when we formed the organization, uh, we started with uh, 42 uh, because uh, 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 we decided that only domestic workers uh, as members, uh, the membership-based organization uh, will be uh, members of this federation. So I will have some uh, slides which I will show you, uh, so which will tell more about my organizations. So these are some uh, uh, facts and figures of which we always remind ourselves why we have the federation. 30% of the total population of the domestic workers are excluded from any labor legislation protection. 45%, almost half, work every day. 35% excluded from maternity benefits. And in Middle East and many Asian countries, they are not considered as workers, even on paper, and cannot form trade unions. So this is uh, our founding Congress two years ago. Uh, the domestic workers leader voted uh, constitution and also uh, elected the first leadership. And this is our aim. Uh, we believe uh, only a strong, democratic, united, uh, organizations uh, is the key to protect and advance our rights everywhere. 
So this is our structure. Uh, we have a Congress, uh, which will be held every five years. And uh, we have an uh, executive committee, which consists seven members. And the secretariat is in Hong Kong. We have now 58 affiliates in 46 countries, 18 in Africa, seven in Europe, 12 in Asia, and Americas, North America, Latin America, and the Caribbean, total 19. So we are also a member of a global union federation, the IUF. We are also a member of a women organization, uh, women in the informal economy. Um, yeah, there are some uh, uh, facts and figures about my organization. Uh, just uh, two months ago, we did a membership survey. Uh, among the 58, 44 replied. Uh, so um, uh, the total membership from 37 is uh, now uh, 399,000. Yeah, maybe I can skip this. Um, so on campaign and research, 67% uh, of our affiliates uh, says that they use IDWF materials. So that is very encouraging. We should do better. Uh, on uh, migrant domestic workers, so only 22 affiliates report they organize uh, international migrant workers. So less than half of our affiliates organize migrant domestic workers. And 19 of them have domest migrant domestic workers in the leadership. On international work, uh, 20 affiliates uh, told us that uh, they have activity with the trade union centers in the country. Uh, and 24 report that uh, they have public support from the trade union centers and 21 are affiliated to trade union centers. And 11 of them have uh, domestic workers leadership uh, in the trade union center in the country. So this is uh, a very encouraging sign. So this slide is about uh, how our affiliates are doing in, in, in supporting migrant domestic workers. So the first is uh, on awareness raising uh, on the issues of, uh, no, uh, with uh, decision makers. So only 25 of our affiliates responded, and among them, 84% says yes. And, uh, and then 70% of the 34 uh, have support for domestic workers who come to their country. And then 76% of the 34 support internal migrants, domestic workers. And 75% of the 32 have filed complaints uh, for the migrant domestic workers. And 33.7% did uh, pre-departure uh, support. So this, uh, so now I'm going to show a few uh, slides of, uh, our, of, uh, active, uh, of our affiliates which uh, health activities rela uh, relating to migrant domestic workers. So this is uh, in India uh, last year. Uh, it was the first ever public hearing attended by uh, government officials from several departments uh, on the, uh, 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 on the on the issues of uh, returnees. Uh, from the Middle East countries. So for the first time, uh, uh, the returnee uh, migrant domestic workers uh, spoke up uh, and uh, told their issues to the government. And uh, yeah, this is an action in Thailand by our affiliates. Uh, it was about uh, a UN official who abused his Ethiopian domestic workers. And of course, uh, he, uh, you know, he was free. So our affiliates in Thailand uh, went to outside his house to demonstrate. Uh, but unfortunately, until now, uh, uh, we have not heard uh, that he has been uh, arrested or he has been uh, 
discipline, uh, no, nothing, <laughs> nothing has happened. Because he's a diplomat, so you know he has uh, immunity. And this is uh, in the U.S. The NDWA uh, just uh, a week ago uh, did the hundred miles uh, to press for immigrants' rights by a hundred women. Uh, this is in Hong Kong, uh, the Federation of Asian Domestic Workers Union. Uh, John the May Day Rally. Uh, so dom you see domestic workers of different nationalities uh, join together to, to march. Okay, that's it. Um, yeah, what I yeah, just to conclude, what I want to say is uh, in my organization, we have not done uh, very much. We have not uh, 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 done a lot in uh, organizing migrant domestic workers. Uh, so uh, we have uh, a, a fix for ourselves, a goal in the next five years to organize uh, 200,000. Mm. So now we will work very hard uh, to uh, outreach to migrant domestic workers and also uh, to educate ourselves, uh, especially uh, our uh, affiliates which you uh, only organize local domestic workers but uh, in countries where there are lots of migrant domestic workers, we'll start to expand and include uh, everyone, including the migrant domestic workers. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, next, we are going to hear from two caregivers uh, who are affiliated uh, with the Caregivers Action Center. Uh, first, uh, Teta Bayan, uh, who's a Filipina caregiver. Uh, she has had over five employers in Canada, and she's caught in the complications arising from the recent changes to the caregiver program. Uh, she's an uh, organizer with the Caregivers Action Center. Teta Bayan. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm Teta Bayan. I'm a caregiver and member and organizer of the Caregivers Action Center. The Caregivers Action Center is a grassroots organization of the former and present caregivers from different countries fighting for justice for the migrant caregivers. We do a lot of popular education work. We disseminate information on workers' rights by holding meetings with caregivers from different countries and from different parts of the cities, of the city, I mean. We host workshops at places like consulates, workers' centers, churches, legal clinics, and other community spaces. We also hold monthly community legal clinics where we support caregivers who are facing struggles and challenges related to employment and migration. We work with community lawyers to provide those free legal services. Also, we are involved in political work. A past campaign of ours was around recruitment fees. Caregivers pay 3,000 to 5,000 US dollars to come here to Canada just to work. We call those recruitment fees. Can you imagine a year worth of your salary just to get a job, a minimum wage job for that matter. We campaigned and lobbied and provincial, the provincial government to ban recruitment fees, and we won through a bill called Bill 210. Right now, we are trying to get better labor legislation to protect caregivers. How many of you knew that the present provincial government is reviewing your basic rights as a worker. Well, the Caregiver Action Center presented before the Ministry of Labor and the special advisors that are doing the review. We ask for sectoral bargaining for caregivers. We ask for sick leave, paid sick leave. More presence of the Ministry of Labor in our workplaces and enforcement. For example, Caregivers are working 15 to 20 hours overtime each week. 
and not getting paid over time. By next spring or summer, we expect some proposed changes to labor law, and we will need you then to make sure they include better labor rights for caregivers. Also, we are working on federal issues that affects caregivers, such as immigration policy. Last November, the Harper government made changes to the caregiver program, which sounded too good to be true. The changes were adver advertised as ways to protect caregivers. For many years, we have fought to get rid of the requirement that caregivers live in their employer's home. The live-in employment arrangement gives substantial control over our food, our personal space, sleep, and the ability to see friends and family. There is often no clear boundary between on-duty and off-duty. This leaves many of us often to intimidation and reinforces inequality of power between us and the employers. So it was good for caregivers when the federal government finally listened to us and made it optional for the caregivers to live in in the employer's house. But this change is only for caregivers coming into the program after November 2014. The government used this announcement to push through other changes to the caregiver program that are making it much harder for us. The changes have made more barriers for caregivers to change jobs, to secure work permits, and in the end, to apply for the permanent residency. The Harper government is locking us into bad jobs. We are tied to one employer where they can do everything they want. And we are obliged to stay. In line of an upcoming election, where migrant workers cannot vote, we need your support. Whoever is going to win the election, we need your help making sure migrant workers' rights are improved and not forgotten. After the election, we are going to call on you for your help, asking the elected government, whoever it is, for such thing as open work permits and permanent resident status upon arrival for the caregivers. Please sign up our petition. Thank you very much and have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you, Teta. Uh, next, we have Iris Diaz, uh, who is also a caregiver. Uh, she's uh, an organizer and a member uh, of the Caregivers Action Center. She's from Peru. Hello, everybody. My name is Iris Diaz. Uh, I am from Peru. Uh, I arrived to Canada in January this year. Um, am I sorry? <coughs> I am also an um, organizer at the Caregiver Action Center. The Caregiver Action Center is a, is a group of current and former caregivers, and we have been working of for fair employment and immigration reform since 2007. We caregivers, we migrant women of color, are not invisible women. We can speak out. Caregivers work inside private homes and so our exploitation is not seen to the public. We are forced to cook, do housekeeping, take care of children, pets, clean, do groceries, and drive the employer around. How many jobs can one person do? We are no machines. Employers want everything perfect and fast. When employers interview caregivers, they always say, I want, to be, I want you to be lovely and affectionate with my kids. They want to buy love with their money. Can money buy love? Caregivers interact with the children more than their own parents. Caregiving involves emotional work too. 
especially since we sacrifice time with our own families to take care of Canadian family. Canada has historically brought over caregivers from the Caribbean and this has shifted towards mostly the Philippines, Indonesia and some from Latin America. It's clear that Canada needs caregivers, so why are we treated so badly? There used to be books about how to be a good wife. It involves to clean the house, the food, the dinner must be ready, the kids clean, the house organized, to be happy and don't complain about everything because the husband is going to be very tired. He needs peaceful in the house. <laughs> now, this is what caregivers do. We have to keep the house clean. We have, we have the job of the good wife. We continue to do the work of patriarchy, raising kids and cleaning the home. Some of them are vulnerable to social violence, physical violence, and sexual violence. There is also economic violence. This is oppression. This is contemporary women's slavery. Where is the freedom? Under the caregiver program, or work permits tie us to one employer. We have to do two years of service under the caregiver program before we can apply for permanent residence. Employers have a huge amount of power over us. It's hard to leave abusive employers, and when we lose our job, it's hard to get new work under the caregiver program. Many of us end up working without status, leaving us even more vulnerable to abuse. We should not be treated like slaves. People think that slavery in Canada was disappeared centuries ago, and Canada promotes itself as a free country, but this is not true. There is, there is modern day slavery in Canada today because of labor programs like the caregiver program. Some rich women who employ caregivers go to work and have advantage. They are improving their situation, they have more money and opportunity. But in the house, who is there? The nanny and the kids. We migrant women of color can only have equality when caregivers have the same rights. We want the change in the situation for caregivers in Canada is together with women's rights, women's equality and social justice. At the Caregivers Action Center, we believe that all caregivers and migrant workers need to have permanent status upon arrival in order to make the situation less precarious. This will make the situation less dangerous, more safe, and less vulnerable to abuse and exploitation. It will also give us more rights. Caregivers and all migrant workers deserve permanent residence upon arrival. Thank you. Thank you, Iris. Uh, our next speaker is Elena Lam. Elena uh, has, uh, is with the uh, Sex Workers Project, Migrant <coughs> Sex Workers Project. She is the f founder of Butterfly, uh, which is an Asian and migrant sex worker support network. Uh, she, um, is, uh, she has a number of degrees, uh, so uh, academically. <laughs> Uh, and, and she has advocated for sex workers, migrants, uh, labor, and gender justice for more than 15 years. Elena. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, let me start with uh, what is Migrant Sex Worker Project. Migrant Sex Worker Project is formed by three organizations. One is No One's Is Illegal. The other is Strike. Is, uh, Chanel is here. She is also the co-founder. It's a um, sex worker organization in Toronto and Butterfly. Butterfly, as she said, is the Asian and migrant sex worker organization. And I'm so glad we have chance to hear talk about our workers' right, talk about the labor right. Because it seems easy, but it's not easy. Because sex worker always don't recognize as work. So that the door is not always open. So I really need to thanks for the friends here the people advocate the migrant rights, workers' rights, and still open the door for us. So that is so important, thank you. 
And, and I also need to thanks for my friend, old friend. <laughs> because the door is not easy. When we meet, and then actually we met 15 years ago when I was still a child, right? <laughs> so because I start organized sex worker in Hong Kong 15 years ago, and at that time it's also not easy because like what I say, no one recognized sex work is work. So at that time CTU is the labor union in Hong Kong. So we want to have the discussion about the sex worker issue. I know it's so difficult. A lot of workers, they say, no, 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 they are the bad people. They're the bad worker, they're bad migrants. So that should not include them. But CTU is so, so, so supportive to give us the space and create the dialogue. So to talk to the people, because what the people, what's the people in power do? Um, what the, uh, the government and the people in power, they always make us feel that we have bad worker, good worker, bad migrant, good worker, bad woman, good woman. So they make us fight with each other. But we are not, everyone, we are good. Because we work hard to survive, we work hard to support ourselves, we work hard to pursue our dream. So that they always use this strategy to divide us, as you say, right? Local sex worker, they are local, even not sex worker, local worker, they don't see the, the difficulty of the migrant worker. But it's so good now. We need to open the door and then we can build a coalition and we fight the rights together. And when we talk about migrant sex worker, the people think it's very invisible. But when you really, really put down your glasses, you may find actually they are everywhere. They may be the one sit next to you. They may be your neighbor. They may be your coworker. So sex work is, is something very interesting because many people think that, oh, it's an ex ex exploitative issue for the woman, right? How the woman sell the body, right? But we always said we are not selling my body. We're selling our work like uh, effort, right? Like every worker, right? So you see migrant, especially migrant, what they have, they only have their body, right? So they will use our effort, we use our brain, we use different part of our body to earn money to support. So, and I think um, when I was in Hong Kong and here, I also met a lot of migrants. So why they need to involve in sex work is because a lot of migrants, especially now the government take away the right of many migrants. So before they can work in a lot of sector, but now they are not able anymore. For example, refugee, now it's more difficult to get the permanent resident when you have to file the refugee claim. So when the people lost the case, what they do, they need to become undocumented, right? They, they, then they are very limited choice what they can do. And the other is like students. Students, before they can work in massage parlor, strip club, but the government take away their rights. They are not work, allowed to work in this place. If you work, want to work in sex-related industry, you, you may need to work indoor. So that you see, actually, is the law take away our rights, make us have a very limited choice. And we also have chance to meet other like caretaker farmers because the this, this working situation is so bad. Sometimes the, the income is so low, and especially, as you say, a lot of them, they may need to pay a lot of agency fee. And a lot of sexual abuse, abuse happen in this place. So some people choose to do sex work as the resistance so that they can run away from their working place or even they don't run away, they have extra income so they can have support their family or they can plan for their future. So, but because they are very discriminated and highly marginalized, so they cannot be visible. So that I really hope that, so how we can open the door for the people ne next to us, just like today. So if we have more chance, really have the positive view on the sex work, on the migrant sex worker, I believe it's more people will visible in front of you. They are willing to share to you. Because if I share with you, you will give me a stone. I will not share with you, right? If you share with you, you give me the support and care so that the world will change. So, and so, and then what I want to talk about is, um, uh, as I said, migrant sex worker is uh, uh, very invisible, but they are also everywhere. Uh, but now they are feeling, uh, having a great challenge is not only the immigration law is keep changing, make them become like more difficult to work. The other part is because um, this year they have just passed the law that 
criminalize sex work. So that the client, if they buy sex, is criminalized, and the third party, if they help the sex worker become criminalized. What has happened is because in our experience, client and the third party is very important to support the sex worker because all the people assume that they are the people exploit them. Actually, no, because when we were in, 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 in our work with the sex worker, just like um, the caretaker, they work in, at home. When they have something happen, they are difficult to run away, right? The sex workers, sometimes they are isolated, they work in work, working place, they may not able to run away. But how, however, the client actually is the, the person that can contact the woman, and then sometimes they can bring them to leave their working condition. And, and then, but now they punish all the clients. The clients don't want to take risks, they don't do it anymore. So that you make the sex worker more isolated. And the other part is the third party. What is third party? Actually, we are the community. When we move to one place, you may share the place you, you, you sleep, you may share the place you work. But now, if I share the place to you, if I help you to work, I become a pimp. That I will become criminalized. I can become the trafficker. So that make the woman is more difficult to support each other. Even the people support each other, they will become the criminal. So that is how the bad law make the woman more, more marginalized. But our, our government don't stop there, right? So it's the money. Do you see the news? They have spent more than $60 million for anti-trafficking initiatives. What they can do, they can do a lot, right, to improve the labor protection, to, to change our society, give housing, give food. We always say we don't have enough resources for refugees, but you don't waste that $60 million for anti-trafficking, they can do a lot of things. <laughs> so, but, but no, some people say, no, 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 anti-trafficking is good. Actually, we are helping the women, we are saving them. You see, the woman is exploited, we need to rescue them. However, when you see what they are doing, you know that it's not. The real agenda is using the name of rescue, actually is import, imposing the border control because now when you come to Canada, especially people from the global south, they have a lot of policy to stop you to come in because they worry, oh, you look young, you look innocent, you are come from global south, you may have chance to be trafficked, so you are not allowed to come anymore. Yeah. So if you want to come, that's you need to pay a lot for other people to help you to come, right? So that's why the debt is coming, because you cannot come by yourself anymore. The other thing what they do is they said, no, so, so many women is working in the brothel. You see in the, in the advertisement always is the woman is being packed like in a package and then so they need us to rescue. So, but when you see the news this year, they have few time have the raid. The raid is the police go to rescue the sex worker. But what they do is they go to the place arrest the woman, mostly is racialized and Asian. And then after they rescue, they deport or detain. And the people working with them become the PIM. So recently in October, there is a guy, he run free working place. Uh, she, he run free brothel. And then he was charged by more than 62 offense of trafficking, um, earning the material benefit. So that is like, Oh, when the people see the news, because the heading no, or normally is Canadian wise positive ring, they have cracked down the organized crime, right? <laughs> then the people say, oh, we feel safe, the police is doing the good thing. It's not. All the money is give more money, the police, to arrest us and do more racial profiling. Mm. And recently we talked a lot of, a, a lot of issues in Toronto, assess with no fear, but actually no. We cannot go anywhere because the police always stare at the people. But they create a panic. Everyone in the society say, wow, I have a neighbor look innocent and she looks sad. And now they have the training material. How do you identify the victim? <laughs> if they look sad, their eyes is empty. And if they are afraid of the police, that you should call and rescue her. So, but you see that actually is a racism policy, they just make the people in the society feel fear because if your neighbor have the people from global South Asian or South American or e Eastern Europe country, so that, that you need to report. So they do this kind of monitoring to kick out these people and that who is the winner, the 
government is the winner because they use the name of rescue, but actually they are against these people. They will remove the people they don't want. Especially sex work, as I said, they are the resistant of many things. They are the resistant of labor exploitation because we have women, they work in factory. In, it's long time, bad condition. We know women, she has been the caretaker and being abused by the boss when she worked by herself and the government don't. Actually, they want you to stay in that slavery environment. Why the government don't give protection to the worker? Because they want to want you to be continuous to abuse. It's, it's not the boss abuse the girl, it's the systematic, it's the government, it's allow them to abuse. And they take away the autonomy of the woman. So that I hope today we don't have so much time to talk a lot of detail. So we have a postcard, it's called um, We Need Rights Not Rescue. So there is the website is, uh, of the Migrant Sex Worker Project. You can go there and, and see more. And now is we really, really need your help because the government is not only using the criminal law to against the sex worker. They are also using a lot of municipal law and also using a lot of community um, uh, monitoring so that you really, really need to help to educate the people next to you. So when you see the sex worker, you don't need to panic. You can smile to them, right? So <laughs> <laughs> and then talk to them to see what she really need, right? It's not you assume that she need rescue. Maybe she need a pancake or pizza. So, <laughs> so that is important that we really need, maybe she really need your help. So that's why we also very important, we create the information how to empower the people, they can escape the situation. I don't say they don't being exploited. They work long hours, they have work injury, and some have very bad employer, just like other workers. But because they are not like other migrants workers, most of them are Sex work is not recognized as worker. They are not allowed, uh, they are not protected by the labor law. So that's why the explosive situation is still continues to happen. So that, that it will not be changed one day, but it all needs your help and your understanding, educate the people next to you that hope the situation can be changed. And then other than this butterfly, because migrant sex worker is also the community highly, highly stigmatized. They cannot easy to voice out. So. Um, Migrant Sex Worker Project have support Butterfly, create a Butterfly Voices project. So that here is, um, so that they have write some of their, their voices story and then they have do some drawing. So we want to, want to do some fundraising, $5 a package. So, <laughs> so, so and, and because we still don't have any funding to do anything. And the other thing is, um, as she said, we don't have vote. Why the government can exploit this group of people and keep taking away the rights of this group of people because they don't have the role, they don't have power. So you need to support them. And also, like before the migrant, permanent resident, they come to Canada, they can pass the test and become the citizen. But now it's more and more difficult for the people to become permanent resident. And more and more people, difficult to pass the test to become the citizen. That means even the migrant, they stay here for a long time. They have right to stay, but they don't have the right to, to vote. So that the government still can continue exploiting them and oppressing them and don't have the good policy to protect them. So, and then that's all for my sharing. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Elena. Uh, our, our next speaker is Thelma Green. Uh, Thelma is an agricultural migrant worker uh, from Jamaica, and, and she has also worked in a food packing factory in Essex country for two years. She's a member of Justicia for Migrant Workers. Good, up, good night, everyone. Good night. <laughs> My name is Thelma Green. I am a migrant worker from Jamaica. Firstly, I would like to tell you a little bit more about my work. I came here from 2013 to work in a packing house. However, we were working from 3.30 in the afternoon until 5 a.m. in the morning. We have to package the vegetables to sip and label them. We work long shifts 
every day. Sometimes we don't even get one single day for ourselves to do our personal duties. However, we recognize that we wasn't getting our overtime paid during those times we worked for over seven months without overtime pay. When we confronted our employer, because we came as a group, so we girls just go to the employer, we had a meeting and we asked him about it. He told us that we should just forget about the overtime pay and that he will pay us from then since. We were in shock knowing that we worked so hard for that little bit of extra money and we were robbed of it. He even told us that if we don't forget about it, he will let us pay for, we were already paying for rent and he will add an addition fee of paying utility bill, pay our own taxi to go in the town, pay to go to work and also to pay for internet. Why is it? We have to suffer. We, we have to leave our families, our loved ones back home to come on this program to earn a little bit of money so that we can help our family. And yet still, we have been robbed. We have been treated as slaves. We have been quiet for several years, but it is time when no more is no more. This job, <laughs> this job we are doing is very, very hard. We have to go in the sun. We have to prepare the vegetables. We have to ensure that every single day you go into the supermarket, your vegetable is already packed and waiting for you to buy it. We are the one who has to be exposed to these chemical which causes diseases, cancer, which is very high risk right now in everywhere you turn to. We are the only one who is willing to do this type of work because no Canadian will not, is not willing to do that type of work. Everyone should be treated equally. It doesn't matter what type of job you are doing, everyone should be should have the equal right. We, when we are entitled to get our overtime paid, we should get paid same as everyone else. We are paying taxes, and when we pay our taxes, we don't even get half of that money that we pay. This life is so unfair. We should be entitled to get holiday pay, vacation pay. We should get at least one single day for ourselves to be able to relax like normal person and able to do our personal duty. Most of all, when someone gets injured at workplace, they fight them. They, they, if they are not able to perform the way that they should, they will send, back, they will send them home because they are not able to perform that duty. I was in that same trap. I was injured at my workplace, and they tried to send me home, but because I had a support, I am right here today able to speak to you. <laughs> Is it, it's not fair to come to this program and only to find out that someone has passed away. Their families waiting for them to come back home, only for their dead body to go back home. This is really, really sad, and it's often happened over and over again. It is so sad when you work so hard for that money, and yet still you're not able to get it. It is so hard. <laughs> It is so hard as we as migrant workers always treated unjustly. Why is it? I would like for everyone here to just take a deep breath and wonder and, and think 
why is it why is it that when someone is doing an important job they have to leave their families to come to a different country and yet still they are not treated as just a worker but ju they're just treated unjustly I am here today asking everyone who is here to help us to make a change because we are tired of treating unjustly and we need justice. Thank you all for listening. Thank you very much, Selma. Our final speaker is uh, Zasna Miranda Leal. Uh, Zasna is an organizer with the Migrant Workers Alliance for Change, uh, which is a cross Canada coalition of migrant worker groups and their allies. Zasna. Good evening, everyone. Um, so my name is Sasna. Uh, I've been an organizer for a few years now with Justice for Migrant Workers, and now I'm a part of the Migrant Workers Alliance for Change as well. Uh, but before I start, I wanted to recognize uh, that my sister's here on my right. Um, it wasn't easy for any of them to be here today. Mm -hmm. um, some of them face, potentially face reprisals for what they're doing here today. Some of them are covering their faces. Some of them are using fake names. Uh, none of which we'll admit to you, but um, I would like us to recognize the strength and the courage that it took for them to be here today speaking publicly in a room full of iPhones and cameras. So. I think we really don't. I think we often don't think that, that it could be hard to come on a panel, right? But it can, so uh, to me, it's very, um, I'm really honored to be on this panel um, and to be the last speaker after so many amazing words. Um, I mean, Elizabeth and the work that you're doing uh, internationally is really just inspiring for us in so many ways. This Sunday, we had a closed door meeting with some uh, caregivers and farm workers, all women and an all women meeting, uh, which never happens and which changes the tone of, of the conversations that you have completely. Um, and we were able to hear about the work that you've done internationally. Uh, I mean, Elaine, you uh, work uh, to work with workers' rights in an industry that is criminalized, right? I mean, to, to, to just think about the level of complexity that that adds to anyone's work. Um, and then my sisters in the Caregivers Action Center, um, all of them work. They come here on the evenings and on the weekends to be part of these things, right? And uh, I mean, Thelma, I, you heard her story, right? She actually just was like, no, I'm not leaving. I am going to stay here and fight for my rights. I mean, just the fact that she's here means that there are hundreds of women who are not here because they did get on that plane. They did leave. Um, and so all of them inspire me every day. I mean, um, Iris and Thelma were both in front of the special advisors of this law. Um, uh, review of labor law that is going on, and they both um, they both told the men the truth, right? They sat in front of these two older white men, and they just they told them what it was like to to work in in the conditions that you guys have heard about. So I, I think I just want to give everyone here some recognition and some love. Um, so even. Um, as I was sitting here and listening to everyone, I uh, wrote down some words that uh, were used over and over. Um, I heard vulnerable, I heard tied, I, had, I heard debt, exploitation, obliged, abusive, and abuse. I heard locked into um, slavery, precarious, dangerous, etc. I mean, you all heard these words, right? It probably brought imagery into your head about uh, what it's like to work in these programs or without status in Canada. Um, and I think the first reaction is often, <gasps> let's shut it down, right? Uh, how many of you have heard, let's shut down these programs? I want to see some hands. What? Yeah, OK. Um, and I, I can see why that happens, right? We're all, oh, this is so horrible. Clearly, this program is really, really bad. It, it creates 
uh, conditions from the beginning, so the program is not flawed, right? It was created in order to, to make workers and women uh, and racialized people vulnerable, and, um, and so that's why we hear over and over, let's shut it down, let's shut it down. Um, but I think even as, especially because we're going into an election, uh, and I think most of us on this panel can't vote. Can I know? Okay. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but it just, it means, for us it doesn't mean much in terms of voting, but it means uh, people are talking about issues related to the federal government and immigration policies more. Uh, and even though migrant workers aren't really an election issue, uh, we're surprised that refugees are now an election issue and that, uh, well, that's a whole other panel, but um, I think it just means we're talking more about these issues, and while we talk about these issues, we want to address this whole let's shut it down approach, right? So I loved um, these postcards, and I loved how Elaine and really everyone on this panel, I think, um, addressed the fact that women don't need saving, women need support, women need rights. Um, and so just like, who here has had a crappy job? I wanna see some hands. Crappy job, shitty job, bad boss, yeah? Um, and when was the last time that somebody came and tried to shut down your workplace? Tim Hortons, did they shut it down, right? Was your mom like, let's shut it down, let's call the police and let's shut it down? No, right, that doesn't happen. It's a paternalistic approach. Um, to people having bad jobs. We, um, because you were probably, at that time, only doing that job because you decided that you had to, right? Because you needed to pay for rent, because you had children, because for, for whatever reason, right? Um, and so you would have probably been like, actually, I work there, I kinda need my job. Um, you can't shut it down, right? Uh, what I want is for it to be a good job, right? And so that's why uh, we, uh, do not want to pro uh, shut the program down uh, despite the, the conditions that it creates. And, and I know that at first might sound weird, uh, but what we want um, is for people to have rights. And status on arrival is something that I'm gonna talk to you about today. Um, so what that means, it might not make sense for everyone who doesn't hear about this stuff every day, but what that means is we want uh, workers in all industries to be able to come to Canada with status. Just like, ha has anybody heard of the point system? You know someone who came through the point system? Let's see. Point system, yeah, okay. Uh, the point system was, uh, I guess, the old school way in which a lot of people came to Canada. If you passed a certain test, uh, if you had these points, you came to Canada with permanent residence, and so did your spouse, and you brought your children with you, right? Um, and the government of Canada, as you've seen today, has created these programs. Um, many, many years ago, this is not recent, and it's not just a conservative issue. Um, the federal government, has created and expanded programs in which only people considered low-skilled don't have access to permanent residence. And who is doing those low-skilled jobs? Women, mm -hmm. right? Racialized people, right? People uh, of color from countries where we're mining and destroying local livelihoods. Um, people uh, from countries where we've impacted economies through our free trade agreements. Right? So um, it's very important for us that we are talking about people coming with status from the beginning, right? So um, what I really liked about this panel is that everyone here resists on a daily basis. It just, it was it's so inspiring to be um, around these, these folks. And I wanna just told you, tell you about some examples of other, uh, other examples of women and workers resisting even in these uh, extremely exploitative circumstances. Um, so, for example, uh, did anybody hear about the Prestige case? No, okay, a couple hands, all right. You don't need to raise your hands over there at the MWAC corner. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, everybody worked on the case, that's why, right? But, um, so that was a group of women, it was uh, over 44 women, migrant women working in a greenhouse in the Windsor area in Leamington, who were sexually assaulted and abused by their employer on a regular basis. Um, they started a case against the employer and uh, recently the two women that remained in the case after the traumatizing process that any case is when it's uh, related to sexual assault and abuse, the two Mexican women that were left in the case won recently, one of the biggest settlements in the history of the human rights 
uh, Tribunal of Ontario, um, they fought back, right? It was a group of um, Thai and Mexican women who, uh, who organized for years, right? Who got in touch uh, with us, with their union, who started a case and fought for eight years. The case took eight years. Um, some of those women are permanent residents now, some are not longer in Canada, some are undocumented. Um, but that took a lot of courage. And some of those same women, some Filipino and Thai women down there that were working in a packing house, actually probably the same one, um, those women led uh, the first ever march and public action uh, by migrant workers in Canada of that size. They wor walked for 12 hours. It was a 52 kilometer march from Leamington to Windsor. Um, against recruitment fees and for migrant worker rights. And that was led and organized by women who all talked about the route, talked about what we were gonna do when police showed up, made the food, yelled at men that didn't wanna show up because they were scared, um, uh, told everyone in the community, did the outreach. Um, they just, they did so much of the work. They led the organizing um, and and I think we don't recognize enough how important women are in, in resistance and in movements and how they bring people together. You should have seen them yelling at the guys in the same greenhouse that were scared to come. They were like, whatever, you have a wife, a wife at home who also works. I am the single provider for my family and I'm going out because this is important. I take care of my children alone back home. Um, so, you know, stop being a coward, right? And uh, they well, shamed some men into coming out. Um, but then there was a, uh, also Adrian Monrose, right? A Caribbean worker who was fired because he fought back his employer who was using racial insults and slurs in the workplace constantly. Um, he was fired and he also won uh, a big human rights case that has actually been talked about a lot in the area and that has really changed how employers are really just covering their ass now. Um, but it's, it's meant that it has started discussions in the area about how, shit, they can take us to the Human Rights Tribunal. Did you know? No, I didn't know. Okay, so that means we have to stop um, certain practices or pretend. Juana Tejada was a woman who got cancer. Uh, she was a caregiver, a Filipina caregiver. She got cancer while working in Canada. Um, and so that meant that when she applied for her permanent residence um, and she had to go through a second medical examination to be to be uh, to determine whether or not she was admissible to Canada, um, she failed it, right? Because she developed cancer when she was here, so she was rejected for her permanent residence application. Um, caregivers from the Caregiver Action Center and others in the city organized and rallied outside the hospital where she was, um, and got that second examination scrapped, right? Because they fought back. They were in the media every week. Some of my, some some of you might remember, right, when that happened, um, and so. I just wanted to highlight, every time somebody doesn't get on the plane, every time somebody chooses to do other types of work to uh, escape a bad working situation, every time uh, obviously somebody uh, organizes and, and uh, rallies publicly and comes and speaks to you on a panel, that's resistance, right? So again, there's no saving needed here. What we need is your support. And my job is to uh, come here to support everyone who's on this panel, but then tell you how exactly you can support. So there's three things that I'm gonna talk to you about. So I think it was mentioned already that, did anybody know that your labor law is getting reviewed? That impacts all Canadians? Let's see. Who knew that all of your basic labor rights was being reviewed right now by the province? Okay, so you should know that, right? That's uh, labor le legislation that impacts everyone no matter what the status is, technically. Um, and so uh, some people on this panel have been uh, part of that work and uh, we have, uh, yeah, we've put together submissions and presentations of several workers um, and we have looked at, for example, the fact that many industries uh, where caregivers where migrant workers are working, such as caregiving and agriculture, are actually excluded from some really basic labor rights. So um, did you know that in agriculture you don't have to get paid the minimum wage, right? Or overtime? Um, did, um, in fact, even though caregivers are supposed to get overtime, I've actually never met a single caregiver who got paid for her overtime work. Have you? No, we talked about this the other day. We've never met someone who's been paid for all the hours that they worked, even though they have those rights on paper, right? 
So we definitely included all of those things in uh, our submissions. And what's going to happen now, as uh, Teta was saying, is that uh, the, those recommendations are going to come out, and we're going to need uh, your support, not your saving, your support in uh, going to uh, your local MPPs and um, looking at what the recommendations are when they come out, uh, seeing if they cover everything that we need, uh, trying to improve them if they're not good enough, which, you know. Um, and so we, we're really gonna need that help uh, soon, and we're starting now, we're all setting up uh, meetings with MPPs, and again, the ones of us who don't vote, um, <laughs> They're less likely to listen to us, but uh, we, we pretend like we're, you know, locals or whatever. So uh, we really need your support in this. Uh, we have a sign-up sheet, and that is how we're contacting people uh, around that. So if you could sign up, that would be amazing. Um, but also, right after the election, Teta told you, right? Uh, right after the election, I th no matter who wins, and let me be clear, no party has a good platform on migrant worker issues. No party. None. Um, we're going to be organizing and we're going to be coming to you for your for your help and for your support in actions that we're going to be organizing. Uh, you've heard what it's like to have a, a tied work permit or a closed work permit where you cannot change jobs no matter how shitty it is. So those shitty jobs that you told me about, you left them, hopefully, or ho you know, perhaps you're in a different job now. Imagine not being able to leave them ever, right? So uh, we're going to be looking at work permits. Uh, we're going to be looking at that circular, circular migration. I've never heard it called that way. Um, <laughs> but the government introduced the 4 and 4 rule, right, which, which means uh, some workers, including caregivers and many farm workers, are not going to be able to work in Canada past four years. Then they can leave for four years, and then if they want, they can return another four years. right? So it's exactly creating those, uh, those circles where uh, you can come here and then you're no longer allowed to for no good reason and then you can come probably to your same job uh, four years later. So we're going to be looking at all of that and I think as everyone highlighted, um, access to rights will not happen unless workers have permanent status in Canada. You've heard what it's like when a worker gets fired because they stood up for their jobs. Now imagine getting deported when you stand up for your for your rights. Um, so, yeah, I think that's it. We need a uh, permanent status on arrival. Please sign up um, and, and support all, all of this amazing work that already happens, all of this resistance that is happening. Um, so that's it for me. Thank you, Zasna, and thanks again to all the contributors to this uh, panel. Uh, we started a little late, uh, so if we go with the scheduled time, we have about 10 minutes left for uh, some discussion, I, uh, but, but we may be able to go about maybe another 10 minutes extra. Uh, okay, um, I would like to open the floor uh, for some short comments and questions. And please introduce yourselves. And if you are uh, directing your question to a specific panelist, please uh, identify who, who you are speaking to or asking your question to. Um, I'm not sure who this question is for, but um, I just wanted to understand, you talk a lot about how before there were options for residency for migrant workers and how that might have closed recently. So can you talk a little bit about any consultations that might have taken place before that changed and also what it was like before? So I know through Express Entry, the, pr the provincial nominee program seems to be a possibility, but can you just talk a little bit about how the options have changed and what they were before and now? Um, okay, so to be clear, in Ontario and in Canada generally, there have never been very good options for people who are considered low-skilled, who are generally racialized poor people and women. Um, the provincial nominee program in Ontario does not include, so the provincial nominee program is a program through which 
every province has a certain number of people that they can tell the government, the federal government, this is who we need for our industry because it's based on uh, manufacturing and entertainment. And so they nominate people, so that means you're applying to the province first and they sort of um, have an agreement with the federal government. It's different for every province. Ontario does not have a single place out of its, what is it? It's, it was 300, I think it's going up to 500. Uh, 5,200, uh, 5, um, they don't have a single place for considered low-skilled workers. Um, it's for high-skilled workers and PhD graduates mostly. Um, and then uh, there was for a while the Federal Skilled Worker Program, the Federal Skilled Trade Worker Program, so all different programs, but all for so-called high-skilled people, so people with professional degrees. Um, not people working in, in the industries that are represented mostly here. Um, and the caregiver program has changed. Um, and But I'll let, I'll let uh, the Caregiver Section Center tell you about how that's changed and made it harder. Um, it is still possible for caregivers to apply for permanent residence, it's just harder. Yeah. In the old pro program for the caregiver, um, after completion of 3,900 hours or equivalent to at least 22 months or 24 months basically of employment um, literally living in your employer's home you can apply for a permanent resident permit but since the changes that they made last November 24 before you can apply for a permanent resident you need to have a year of study an English exam and some other requirements that they're really asking, um, which is which we find very unreasonable because mostly caregivers um, imagine the two-year wages that we would be making will not be sufficient for the one-year study. So um, we had this thought that they are secretly shutting down the program, and what we are doing at the present time is trying to preserve the program while obtaining better protection and rights for the caregivers. Any other questions or comments? Good evening, everyone. I just would like to thank Ryerson University for um, organizing this beautiful panel. I'm very proud of all of you. I'm so proud that I am here today. Actually, I, I'm so speechless while you are all talking and I can relate to most of the caregivers um, predicament because I was, a I was a caregiver myself, and being a caregiver, I went through the same or similar predicaments that most of the caregivers went through. I did not stop from there. I finished my undergrad studies in social work here at Ryerson University, and then I took my master's in social work here at the same school, Ryerson University. My major research paper is looking into the complexities of the live-in caregivers program and I'm so happy I did that. I'm not a caregiver anymore but I'm now a clinical social worker trying to help the people who have oppressed me one time. I'm so happy that uh, I went through this program. It has challenged me to stand my ground and I really thank Ryerson University for helping me to change the outlook, my outlook in life. Because without social work education that I had in Ryerson, I am not the person I am today. Um, Dr. Sedef Aratkok was my professor in my political science. Dr. Winnie Ng was my professor. So, and Dr. Akua Benjamin is there. They are all my professors. I thank you, professors, for all your love, support, and for, your, for believing in me. Thank you very much for everything that you have done in my life. 
And I cannot thank you enough. Thank you. Thank you. I, I think Ryerson has been lucky to have you. <laughs> Any other comments and uh, questions? Um, I'm also very glad to be here. Uh, my, my father was uh, a lawyer uh, with uh, Prince Bhutan. Uh, uh, my brother is uh, environmental activist, and I'm also environmental activist at uh, um, that only survived in the last 10 years of the Harper government. We, are at, uh, we meet every Thursday uh, at Davenport. Um, my question is, is, is more so to the expert on, on the problem that's arrived, whether from my father's generation to my brother's generation to my generation of, of uh, this advocacy type of, of work or, or to protect, to bring about the human right and, and, and how do we arrive at this issue? And, and how did the, the expert, uh, the professor at Rice and, and U of T that I'm a part of, how, how are we plan to tag, tackle this issue um, aside from giving the worker the right to, to vote and to be a citizenship and to be part of change and the positive change that we have seen? Um, can um, the professor comment on that, please? Um, actually, I just uh, want a question. Aqua Benjamin, yeah. I just please. have a question of clarification because um, the, the caregiver program, as I remember, as I know, first started off with black Jamaican, black Caribbean women, mm -hmm. right? Um, and one of the stipulations later on that the government instituted was that to get permanent residence, first of all, you couldn't say that you had children. You couldn't say you had children back home, number one. So you had to lie and say you had no children. And then when, <coughs> when women started to apply, um, they were being deported. And even if they had a child here, they were deported. That child and that and that uh, that worker was deported. So there was a lot of there was a lot of activism around that. But one of the things that and I want some clarification, Grace Benjamin, because we fought against. Um, we had an organization, the Congress of Black Women, that along with Intercede, fought against this this stipulation that said. To, to be a permanent resident, not only that your employer had to support your application, number one, but number two, that you had to have a grade 12 education. So you had to take courses here in grade 12 in order to say that you were eligible to become a permanent resident. Now, there was a lot of fight against that because we said um, any Canadian woman, quote unquote, can become a caregiver without having a grade 12 education, right? So that's my question. Is that, is that, that educational bar um, that is still being instituted, maybe there's some change to it, but is that still the case? Because I thought that we had been successful in removing that requirement for permanent residence. Two, that it was not dependent on your employer to sponsor you, number one that you didn't have to say that you didn't have children to apply. And the third thing, that you didn't have to, s to lie and say you had grade 12 when you didn't have it or to spend money to get grade 12 education here when it's not, it's not a requirement for any Canadian woman to be a caregiver. It doesn't have to have that educational requirement. So I'm, I'm, it seems as though, as, as though some things have rolled back. Mm -hmm. um, because I thought that we had successfully pushed provincial government, particularly around labor laws and requirements and that kind of thing, and the federal government to change those policies. It doesn't sound like it's, it's it sounds as though it's still operative. Do 
have a mic? Do you want to let us give you a mic? Hi, uh, good evening, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm um, one of the member and um, volunteer for Caregiver Action Center. And uh, my name is Jonna. Um, as, uh, as you said, that um, since in your time that the policy of caregiver or domestic worker, um, you fought a lot of or make a hard work for it, still, the situation, it didn't change. It become more worse, which is um, in, your, in your time, the education is more um, requirements, but this time, not only education, like most of the caregiver came here, like in Philippines, most of them graduated in universities, nurses, doctors, but still, they required if they do the f in the new changes of um, immigration uh, policy. Since 2014 January, the new changes come out that they have a two stream, which is the elderly stream and the child stream. Now that education they will impose to the elderly stream which is you need to add the post-secondary for a medical needs. So um, the same thing, and you need to um, take a test for a seven level of um, examination, which is too high for us and to the caregivers. But still, um, hopefully those people also that are aware for these changes can help us um, to make um, a proper changes for this situation. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Hi, uh, Marie Clark Walker with the Canadian Labor Congress. Just a couple of comments. Um, the Canadian Labor Congress is the umbrella organization for all the unions across this country and we have um, for a long, long time worked with migrant worker organizations um, to do education and awareness training, not for the migrant workers, but for our own members as to what it is that migrant workers provide. Um, over the last year, we have done a number of, uh, of events and what we're finding is that there's more take up in the work that we're doing uh, with Justica for migrant workers and a number of other organizations for um, communities to get involved in support of migrant workers. That being said, while everyone on the, on the panel is not able to vote, they are able to articulate who they want people to vote for and why people should be voting in that way. And I wanna encourage every single one of you to get out there. And I, I understand that there were comments made at the, at the beginning about things that may be said, may not be liked by others, but we really need to boot Harper out. If we don't do that, <laughs> if we don't do that, we will all, whether you are a temporary foreign worker, whether you're a migrant worker, whether you're low skilled, high skilled, whether you're an immigrant, whether you are a Canadian citizen, it doesn't matter what category you fall into, we're all up Schitt's Creek. So please use your voices. If you're not able to vote, talk to friends, talk to family, talk to anyone who's able to do so, and please encourage them to get out to the ballots before October 19th, so that on October 19th, they can actually go and get people out to vote and help the various campaigns. Thank you all very much. Uh, I guess we have to end. Uh, if there is one final question or comment, uh, we will take that, otherwise, Otherwise, can we wish Teta a happy birthday? Thank you, everyone. Okay.
thanks for uh, thanks again to all the panelists and and to the audience. Uh, this this is a very important topic, and I think I hope we will be able to make some changes on this. <laughs> And thanks, Winnie. <laughs>